The following is a non-profit fan-made version of the original radio program, The Shadow. All sound effects to this video can be found on YouTube and voices on Casting Call Club. Please support the official release. <laughs> The shadow knows. <laughs> Once again, we present to you the thrilling adventures of the shadow. The hard and relentless fight of one man against the forces of evil. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. The Shadow, who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Years ago, in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and mysterious secret the hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. For this month's first episode, The Curse of Baldring Heights. Listen now to the fulfillment of a curse made in the tomb of Rachnes, the first great and terrible king of Egypt. A curse made in the year 3000 BC and fulfilled in the year 1941. Let us go now to Baldring Heights on a warm summer evening. Dr. Baldring, renowned archaeologist, is in his study. He is speaking with his wife. John, it's nearly 11 o'clock. Why don't you stop work and go to bed? But I have so much to do, my dear. My notes are in such disorder. <laughs> Writing the history of the great Arachnes is much more of a job than I bargained for. But, well, I suppose it's my duty. The least I can do for him after digging him out of his tomb after his 5,000 year sleep. John, I've never said this to you before, but why don't you give up this work of yours? I... I haven't slept peacefully since you discovered the tomb of Rachnes. My sleep's been troubled by terrible dreams. I'm afraid for you. Now, Ellie, you don't believe that superstitious rot about Rachnes' curse, do you? I don't know, John, I don't know. But I have a feeling, a premonition that some terrible evil is hanging over your head. John! Now, now, Ellie, it's just started to rain. Perhaps now we shall have a little respite from the heat. John, please, say you'll stop work on the history of Rachnes and go away from here. Why away from here? Rachnes surely can't bother me here in my own house. We're thousands of miles from Egypt. <laughs> but here I am, talking as if Rachnes were able to harm me. Oh, that's what comes from writing histories. Time loses all meaning. John, get rid of that urn. It's that urn I see in my sleep. That urn with the snake coiled around it. The urn? Rachne's wine cup? Oh, I'm ornately fond of that urn, Ellie. But if it bothers you, I'll get rid of it tomorrow. It'll leave a rather empty spot on my desk there. Uh, come in! I hope I'm not bothering you, Doctor. But I just got back from town and I noticed the light burning in the study. I wondered whether you'd want me to give you a hand with the notes? Oh, no. No. Richards, I can get along by myself. You go to bed. All right, Doctor. Just as you say. Good night, Mrs. Baldry. Good night, Doctor. Good, Good night. night. And now don't you think you'd better get to bed, dear? All right, John. Please don't think me silly about that urn. I'll feel so much better when it's out of the house. Oh, it'll be gone tomorrow. I can sell it to any one of a dozen museums all across the country. Good night, dear. Good night, dear. Close the French windows if the rain starts coming in. I will. Good night. I'll get back to work. Uh, let me see... Ah, yes. In the year of famine, Rachnes ornated that families containing more than five children must be reduced to five in order to conserve the food supply. 
Thereupon followed the most brutal, bloody slaughtering of young children ever recorded in the annals of Egypt. Hmm. As near as we can make out from the hieroglyphic inscriptions... What's this? Sounds like... No! No! It can't be! Bjorn! Help! Help! Somebody! Gets on my nerves, Cranston. It's how you and Miss Lane always hear about things before I do. <laughs> I have a uh, connections, Commissioner. And big ears, Grandma. Well, you're wasting your time tonight, Cranston. I doubt if there's anything for my department out here at the Baldering Place. Just a murder, that's all. Now, Miss Lane, we don't know if it's a murder yet. I am not the kind of man which jumps to conclusions. Do you know who Dr. Baldrin was, Commissioner? You tell me. Just about the most famous archaeologist in the world. Is that so? I have a brother-in-law in the building business, too. <laughs> Not architect. Archaeologist. What's the difference? About 5,000 years. You see, an archaeologist digs around the ruins of ancient civilization. To see how they lived, what they thought, how they dressed. Nosy guys, eh? Well, you might call them that. Dr. Baldwin was a preeminent man in the field as a result of his finding the tomb of Rachnus, the great Egyptian king. You must have read about that in the papers about three or four years ago, Commissioner. Yeah. I, I must have. Don't you remember how the papers played up that business about the curse of Rachnus? Yes, that's right. Rachnus placed a curse on the man who disturbed his tomb. <laughs> how long ago was this guy Rachnus buried? Oh, about 5,000 years. And you think that this Baldring was bumped off by a guy who's been dead for 5,000 years? <laughs> Anything's possible, Commissioner. Indirectly, of course. Yeah, well, maybe I'm the wrong guy to handle this case. Maybe we ought to... Have look for the murderer with the with the Ouija board. Of all the sappy things I ever gotten mixed up in, this is the sappiest. Our only suspect died 5,000 years ago. Well, you're gonna have a chance to find out yourself, Commissioner. This is Baldwin Heights. Now look, Dr. Tuttle. If you believe murder has been committed, you had no right to move the body from this study until I got here. But, Commissioner... Don't interrupt me. But, Commissioner Weston, the doctor had just told you he didn't move the body. Mrs. Baldring and her son did. Miss Lane, please remember that you had no right to be... Wait, who moved the body? Mrs. Baldring did, and her son, Storm Baldring. Oh, why didn't you say so before? He did, Commissioner. Three times... Each time you asked Miss him... Miss Lane, stop telling me how to run my business. I'm not, Commissioner Weston, but you... That's enough! Where's Cranston? If he doesn't get you to go home so I Somebody can... Somebody mentioned my name. What seems to be the trouble, Commissioner? Hello, Lamont. Where have you been? Lamont, <laughs> will you please restrain Miss Lane? She's been interrupting me and interfering with my investigation. Margo, stop playing detective. Oh, Doctor... I just had a look for the body of Dr. Baldrin. Did you notice the two small punctures on his upper right arm about half inch apart? Yes, I did, Mr. Cranston. But I can't for the life of me make out what caused them. Now look, Cranston. Don't get all heated up on this thing. Maybe it's only a heart failure, after all. If you start finding strange and non-essential clues, we'll never get this thing straightened out. Commissioner, I think that Dr. Baldrin met death violently. Yes, yes, I quite agree, Mr. Cranston. That... Rigid attitude, his staring eyes, and the look of horror on Dr. Baldrink's face, they all preclude the possibility of heart failure, as I was led to believe when I was first called on the case. Who called you, Doctor? Storm Baldrink. He called me. Well, let's have a talk with Storm Baldrink. But I tell you, Cranston, I still think this is a wild goose chase. Murder? Why, that's preposterous! My father has had a heart condition for years. Didn't Dr. Tuttle tell you that? Yes, Mr. Baldwin. And he also told us that you and your father have not been on very good terms up to about six months ago. Are you accusing me of murdering my father? Just just a minute, Mr. Baldwin. We're not accusing you of anything. But we would like just a few more questions answered. Fire away. What did you and your father quarrel about? My choice of professions. I was interested in music. Naturally, my father wanted me to continue in his footsteps. Archaeology. Mm, I see. That was hardly enough to cause your father to disinherit you and ask you to leave his home. Oh, so you know that too. 
You seem to be so well informed. Why is it necessary to ask me? Mr. Baldwin is right, Commissioner. We know that Mr. Baldwin had a serious quarrel with his father, was away from his home for three years. If you must know everything, my father disapproved of the woman I was going to marry. He cut me off without a cent to prevent me from marrying her. Did you marry her anyway? Yes. For two years, we struggled along trying to live on the money I earned with my music. Then what? About a year ago, she died. Pneumonia. She went without a coat that whole winter. Later, my mother affected my reconciliation with my father. I see. Thank you, Mr. Baldwin. I'd like to speak with your mother now. Mother can't speak with you now. Why not? Don't you remember that before he left, Dr. Tuttle said he was giving Mrs. Baldwin a sedative to quiet her and make her sleep? Oh, oh yeah. That's right. Who else was in the house the night when your father died? Besides myself and my mother, there is Mr. Richards, father's assistant, and father's Hindu servant, Mahdi. Hindu, eh? Ring for the servant and let's have a talk with them. All right, I'll ring. But he won't enter this room. You'll have to speak with him somewhere else. Why won't he come in here? Because your father's body was found here? He hasn't come into the study since my father brought back the urn from Rockne's tomb and placed it on his desk. Why? Where is it? It's on the floor, Mr. Baldwin. That's where we found it when we came into this room. Is it all right to touch it now, Commissioner? Yeah, I guess so. Cardona said there were no fingerprints on it. Hmm. The famous Rockne's wine cup. Quite beautiful. Don't you think so, Commissioner? Cranston, I'm not a connoisseur. I know nothing about vases. Quite valuable, too. Solid gold. Studded with precious stones. It had been appraised at $50,000. Of course, its historical value was much greater than that. Fifty foul? Here, let me see that vase. Urn or wine cup, not vase, Commissioner. Let's see it. Hmm. This looks like the raised figure of a snake crawling around it. The snake was the ancient Egyptian symbol of eternity. So this is the cursed cup, eh? Then you know about that, too. The curse of the pharaoh Rachnus on the despoiler of his tomb. I think the translation of the hieroglyphics on the cup goes, Whomever disturbed the tomb of Rachnus shall meet death from his closest kin. Yes, Mr. Crinston, and I know what you're thinking. Did Sahib ring? These gentlemen would like to question you. Come in. No, no, please, I may not enter. Sahib, forgive, please. If you want to talk to him, you'll have to go someplace else. Madi. I should like to ask you one question. What do you know about snakes and snake charming? What kind of question is that? Commissioner, I have a reason to believe that Dr. Baldwin died from the effects of a snake bite. From what you say, Lamont, it looks as though Storm Baldwin killed his father because he blamed him for the death of his wife. That's the easy solution, Margo, but I'm not sure it's the right one. While Weston has been questioning Madi and uh, Dr. Baldwin's assistant, Mr. Richards, I went over to the study downstairs with a fine tooth comb. Did you find anything? Yes. This. A burnt piece of paper. Yes, but not completely burned, Margo. It's Dr. Baldwin's will. Then you think that the murderer tried to burn the will. Margo, from what I can make out, Dr. Baldwin left the bulk of his estate to Mrs. Baldwin and his assistant, Richards. He left his son exactly one dollar on his best wishes. Lamont, this definitely points at Storm Baldring. He probably tried to destroy the will so he could share in the estate. I don't know, Margo. You see, the muddles of the whole thing, by giving Storm two motives for the murder, and we still don't know exactly how it was done. You said snakes. That wound on Dr. Baldring's upper arm looked like the bite of a poisonous snake. Yes, you know, Margo, the murderer, whoever he is, has purposely and cleverly confused everyone. The finger points at everyone here. Well, I think you ought to turn that burnt portion of Dr. Baldwin's well over to Weston and let him decide. You're right, Margo. But I still don't believe it's Storm Baldwin that we're after. The Shadow is going to pay Mr. Richards a little visit. <laughs> you have a very interesting view from your room, Mr. Richards. What? Who said that? The shadow, Mr. Richards. B but I can't see you. I, I don't understand. I've casted a mist over your mind, making me invisible to your eyes. What do you want of me? The truthful answers to a few questions. What were you watching so intently while I spoke to you? Nothing. I just happened to be looking out the window. The fact that your room here on the second floor looks down across the garden and you can see through the French door of the study, making things convenient. All right. I can see across into the study. Why are you so interested in what goes on in the study? I'm trying to figure out how the murderer got in to kill Mr. Baldring. 
Shadow, he was one of the finest men in the world. He's been like a father to me. I've been with him for 20 years. If you can help in any way to apprehend the killer... You speak of the murderer as though you know who he really is. I do. Look, Shadow, out that window. See the light has gone on the study? There's your murderer. Storm Baldrin. He's looking for something in the fireplace. I know he's a murderer. He hates his father. I'm afraid he won't find what he's looking for. What's that sound? What? Why, yes, I hear it now. Sounds like oriental music. Or the piping a snake charmer uses. Look, Storm Baldrin hears it too. He's frightened. See? He's backing away from his father's desk in terror. The papers are moving on the desk. What's causing them to move? His eyes are staring, fascinated, almost hypnotized. His back is at the door. He's reaching for the knob. He looks as though he's afraid to turn his back of the urn. Storm, he's fallen. Quick, Richards, down to the study. He'll need help. Are you all you want, Cranston? I tell you that Storm Baldrin killed his father and in, re in remorse killed himself. But Commissioner Weston. I think the Commissioner is right for once, Lamont. For once? Now see here, Miss Lane. I am... Commissioner, if you leave this case now, another murderer will occur. I'm sure of it. You're still not trying to make me believe that Rockness the Mummy did it, are you? No, I believe our killer is very much alive and very cunning. Cranston, it's getting light outside. It's morning already and I, had a ha I haven't had a moment's rest all night. If you know so much, tell me who the murderer is and let's go home. It's not as easy as that, Commissioner. Well, Cranston, we've got the motive. Storm Baldring's hate for his father. You found a doctor's will giving everything to Miss Baldring and Richards. Enough motives for a dozen murders. Not a dozen, Commissioner. Just two. Perhaps three. I tell you. I tell you, Storm Baldring's death was suicide. How did he do it? I don't I don't know how yet, but I will as soon as I get the autopsy report from the morgue. There's only one thing that nobody has thought of. What's that? I think I know what you mean, Margo. The murder weapon. Yes, what was it? I think a very deadly little Indian snake called Arachi, which translates means Avenger. <laughs> Snakes, eh? So you still believe that snakes are mixed up in this? I had a talk with Peterson on the phone, and he confirmed my suspicions. Who's Peterson? Peterson's a curator of poison reptiles at the zoo. Well, that settles it. Now the keeper of the zoo is solving crimes. And true. I don't know what you are going to do, Cranston, but I'm going downstairs and getting some, I'm getting some breakfast. And have that Hindu servant, Mahadi. Serve it to you. Uh, why, you... Uh, oh, jeez. Uh, go to blazes! <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet anything Weston goes out for breakfast. You really scared him. Yes. Uh, Mahadi is going to look pretty suspicious from now on to Weston. <sighs> and me too. Seriously, Lamont... What is all this about snakes and piping noises? Do you think Mahdi could have... After all, he is a Hindu, and they know the secrets of snake charming. Perhaps. Margo, where were you when you heard the oriental piping? Upstairs in my room. Why? Upstairs in my room. Why? Upstairs, eh? Was the piping loud? Where did it sound like it was coming from? Now that I think of it, it sounded like it was coming from the next room. That's very interesting, Margo. I heard that piping too, and that's the same impression I got. That it was right in the next room, and I was on the other side of the house. How do you explain it, Lamont? I can't explain yet, Margo. The Shadow is going to make a call on Mrs. Baldrin. The sedative that she took last night must have worn off by now, and there are several important points that I should like to clear up. Mem Saib, it has happened as the gods have willed. <laughs> What is written in the books of fate is written, Mem Sahib. You cannot change nor prevent the will of the gods. <laughs> yes, I could have prevented it! Now they're both gone! <laughs> How could you have prevented the death of your husband and son, Mrs. Baldrin? What? I heard a voice. 
voice. There is no one present here, Mem Saib, but your humble servant, Marty, and yourself. You're wrong, Marty. The shadow is present. You're wrong, Marty. The shadow is present. I can't see you. No, Mrs. Baldrin, but I can see and hear you. It is the voice of the spirits, Mem Saib. No, Mahadi, I am not a spirit. The reason you can't see me is that I have casted a veil of hypnosis over your mind. A trick I learned in your country, India. A land of many strange and mystic phenomena. Not the least of which is Snake Charming. Great Shadow, I do not understand you. I think perhaps, Mati, that you understand me only too well. I think perhaps, Mati, that you understand me only too well. What do you want of us, Shadow? I should like to know how you could have prevented the death of your husband and son. There's no reason for me to conceal it now. My son hated his father. Vowed he would kill him. If I hadn't tried to bring them together again, if I had let Storm stay away from me, or <laughs> my husband would still be alive. Then you believe that Storm killed your husband? Yes, and then committed suicide. It was foreordained, Mem Saib. Written in the words of the great ranks, 50 centuries ago. And Rockney's curse has come true after all. John was killed by his nearest of kin. His own son! It'll make you feel better to know that I believe that your son was innocent of the murder of your husband. What? You believe that? Who is the murderer then? That I can't tell you at this moment. But you must believe that. <laughs> oh, Shadow! Oh, if only that were true! Mrs. Baldrin, to prove that you must tell me everything, I know that you are concealing something from me. I don't know what you mean. The will, Mrs. Baldrin. Dr. Baldrin's will which you and your son attempted to destroy. You know that, too. Yes, I did try to burn the will. It was unfair to cut Storm off without a penny and leave his share to the, the Mr. Richards, my husband's assistant. Couldn't you have helped your son from your share? There was a clause in the will restraining me from giving him any assistance. When Storm carried John up to his room, I searched the desk and found the will. I lighted a match to it and burned it. But not completely. Isn't that true? I wasn't sure, Shadow, so I sent Storm down to the study later on to make sure. It was then that he met his death. What this Shadow says is not true, Mem Sahib. Sahib Storm died by his own hand. It was the will of the gods. No, Mahadi. Dr. Baldrin and Storm met death not from supernatural causes, but with the help of a real and very much alive person. And the Shadow will find out who that person is. Mrs. Baldrin, there is one thing you must remember. Under no conditions you are to enter the study. You are to be the next victim, and death lurks in the study. Oh, Lamont, where have you been all day? I went back into town, Margot. I looked in at a zoo to see my old friend Peterson, got a change of clothes, and... Lamont, things have been happening here at Baldring Heights. The murderer has been caught. What? This morning, you told me not to take my eyes off the door of the study. Yes? I did exactly that. Go on. Well, about three o'clock this afternoon, I saw a man come in from the front door and enter the study. He looked around very suspiciously and then began to examine the urn, Rockness Wine Cup. I didn't know what to do. You weren't here, so I called Commissioner Weston, and he caught him. Who? Professor Beardroff. All right, Professor. If you're innocent, you'll have a chance to prove it in court. Oh, hello, Cranston. Where have you been all day? You missed all the fireworks. Miss Lane tells me that you caught the murderer. Yep. This whole thing is preposterous. I don't understand. Look, Professor Beardroff, if you want to go on denying it, go ahead. Well, we've got you dead to rights. The mere fact that I was examining the Rackney's cup does not mean that I am guilty of Dr. Baldring's or his son's murder. I read the papers that the doctor was dead. I came here to buy the Rackney's cup for my museum. Nothing criminal in that, is there, Commissioner? Listen, Cranston. This professor here was Dr. Baldring's rival. He claimed that Baldring had cheated him by discovering Rockness's tomb first. I had done an equal amount of study and research on the subject. But Baldring 
beat you two to discovery and got all the glory, and you hated him. I did not hate him. You threatened him in public. Once at an archaeologist club. We had words, Look, but... Look, I go on with this? I'm taking you back to headquarters and booking you for the murder of Baldring and his son. Dr. Beardrop, how did you get into the house without anyone knowing you were here? The front door was open. So, you just... You just walked in? Yes. I was so intent upon getting the cup that I didn't think. A likely story. I had my suspicions on you from the first, Beardroth. You knew about the rivalry, Commissioner. It's my business to know. I had my men trailing him since yesterday. I knew he'd turn up here. How did you know? Because a criminal always returns to the scene of the crime. Yeah, that's right. Well, I've got to hand it to you, Commissioner. You really got your man. Bah! You are all out of your heads! Yeah? Well, we caught you, Professor. Come on. I'm taking you to headquarters. Anytime you want to know anything about police work, Cranston, just look me up. <laughs> Come on, Professor. Lamont, you don't really believe that Professor Beardroff is the murderer? No, Margot. But I think I got a better chance to catch the killer if Weston's not in the house. Margot, tonight, I'm going to be the bait that will trap the real murderer. The shadow will return after this quick message. Ladies and gentlemen, make sure to check out our Facebook page for updates on future episodes. And if you have any questions about the program or wish to help voice a character for a future episode, feel free to leave us a message and we will reply as soon as we can. Lamont? Lamont? Are, are you here in the study? Margo, what are you doing here? No, don't turn on the light. I heard you leave your room upstairs and come down here to the study. I was afraid for you. You shouldn't have followed me. It's dangerous here. Shall I go back? No, it's too late for that. Come over here, away from the desk. Where are you? Over here by the ventilator. Stay close to the back wall, away from the windows. All right, Lamont. Ouch! Quiet! I couldn't help it. I bumped into a chair. What are you doing? Just removing the grating from the ventilator. What for? I'll tell you later, but I can tell you that I found what I'm looking for. The murderer? I'm going to meet him in a few minutes. Now, I'm going to go back to the door and pretend to come in. Marco, no matter what happens, I don't want you to move until I tell you to. Stay where you but are. the murderer may see me. Not if you remain crouched here behind this big chair. If anything happens to Lamont. me... Lamont! Hold out your hand. Here. Your revolver? Just in case. Lamont, I'm frightened. Now, nah, Marco. All right, Lamont. Well, here I go. You stay where you are. I'm gonna do a little acting. I'm at the door. Margot, try not to make a sound. Now for a light switch. The killer can't see you, Margot, but he can definitely can see me from where he is. Now to make myself busy around the desk. When is he going to strike? The suspense is getting a little too much for me, Lamont. There. I knew he was watching from this room. Keep your eyes on the urn, Margo. Unless I'm mistaken, you'll see something very unusual. There. Lamont! A snake! It's coming out of the urn! Yes. A very deadly creature it is, too. Lamont, look out! It's going to bite you! Lamont! <coughs> Lamont! Lamont! Are you all right? Quick, Margo! Back where you were! The murderer will be here any second. But what about you, Lamont? I don't know. If my strength holds out, we should have the murderer in time. <laughs> so, Mr. Cranston, you thought you would find out how the others died? You found out all right, but your knowledge won't do you any good. <laughs> I've learned enough to know how you killed Dr. Baldwin and his son, Mr. Richards. Alive? No, Cranston, you were bitten by the snake. I saw it. Yes, I thought you would. But you see, I am still here. So, you know... Well, you'll never leave this house alive! I wouldn't try anything, Mr. Ridget, if I were you. There is a revolver trained right on the center of your back. You can come out now, Margo. I've got him covered, Lamont. So, the game is up. You've caught me. What was that switch you just turned on, Mr. Richards? Just the thermostat control. It seems rather warm in here. I hope you're telling the truth. And now, Richards, 
Why did you kill Dr. Baldron? You said he had been good to you. <laughs> good to me? Do you call using my knowledge for 20 years for his own ends being good to me? It was I who really found Ratchney's tomb. It was I who wrote most of his great learned histories. But what did I get out of it? Nothing! Someday the world will discover that I should have been honored, not Baldring. So you killed him, and killed his son to make it seem though his Ratchney's curse had come true. Yes, but the law will never punish me. Lamont, the snake, it's coming out of the urn again. Uh, stand back, Richard. <laughs> Come, my friend. Come, Arachi, the Avenger. <laughs> Richards! <laughs> When did the doctor say you could get out of the hospital, Lamont? In about a day or two, Margo. That little reptile had more venom than I had bargained for. I still think it was silly to let that horrible snake bite you. Ugh. I had to make the whole act look authentic to Richards. I thought I'd be alright after Peterson at the zoo gave me those two inoculations against snake bites. Inoculations against snake bites, eh? Look at you now. <laughs> Well, without them, I would have been pleased to omit flowers for yours truly. Oh, Lamont, you mustn't even think of such things. Remember, the doctor said you were to think of pleasant thoughts. <laughs> like birds and bees and flowers? Yes. I still don't understand it. What? Birds, bees, and flowers? No, I can't understand how Richards controlled the piping. You said you were with him in his room as the shadow when Storm Baldring was killed by the snake. In fact, you stood next to Richards. In Richard's room and looked down and saw it happen through the window of the study. Margo, do you remember I asked you where you were and when you heard the piping and you said you were in your room? Why, yes. And it sounded like it was coming from right next door. At the same time, I was in Richard's room with him and I got the same impression. That's because the phonograph apparatus that played the piping music that drew the snake to his victim was located in the ventilation system. And the sound carried all over the house. Richards had installed it there, and it had it rigged with the wires so he could control it from different switches almost anywhere in the house. Then that's what he did when he realized he was caught. He turned on the switch to call the snake. Oh, what a terrible brain to plan a thing like that, and then to conceal the snake in the urn. That, Margo, was his most brilliant stroke. Who would have suspected that the, beneath the raisin bejeweled figure of the serpent on the urn, there was a hollow space, just enough room to accommodate a little five-inch killer snake? Arachi. It's enough to give a person bad dreams. You know, Margo, I just had a strange thought. It had better be a pleasant one. Remember what the doctor said. Baldrin in his will disinherited his son. And he stated in his will that Richards, because that he has been so faithful and good, he's been practically his son. What are you driving at? The curse, Margo, the curse. Whomever disturbed the tomb of Rachnus shall meet death from his closest kin. Dr. Baldrin spoke of Richards in his will as my dearest foster son. The curse of Rachnus made 5,000 years ago has been fulfilled. Lamont, you're supposed to have pleasant thoughts. Just think of it. The mummy's hand reached across 50 centuries and tapped... Oh, me. doctor! <laughs> okay, Margo. I'll be a good patient. Once upon a time, there was this little flower. <laughs> 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 the wit of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay for the shadow knows. <laughs> <laughs>been listening to the dramatized version of the many copyrighted stories which appeared in the Shadow Magazine and Old Radio program. All the characters and places named are fictitious, and any similarity to persons living or dead are purely coincidental. If you liked this month's episode, please give us a like and subscribe for more future episodes.